Good morning. Welcome to another edition of Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com, and thanks for tuning in, everyone, and apologize ahead of time for my laryngitis, but we'll struggle through. We uh, are going to continue our reading and discussion of the book, The History of Romanism by John Dowling, and last Friday, we concluded at the top of rather at the bottom of the first uh, full paragraph on page 445, if you're following along. This is subsection 77. And we recount for your memory to kind of gather ourselves up and uh, uh, from the long weekend. We last gave the anecdote. By the way, we're talking about these indulgences, the uh, the last straw, the straw that broke the camel's back and finally provoked the Protestant Reformation. This was a time when Pope uh, Leo X pretended to have the power to forgive sins or sell salvation for money. And uh, it was a a monstrous pretense, and uh, all of of Europe was becoming aware of the uh, false pretensions of the papacy and admitting to themselves that they've been deceived all their lives that anyone representing himself as the vicar of Christ who says that he can forgive your sins uh, for money is a liar. And this is a stark reality, and uh, it's an admonition for both Catholics and Protestants today. (laughs) And you know who I'm speaking about. Salvation can't be bought. Salvation is a gift. And it was through a costly shedding of the blood of our beloved Savior and the only begotten Son of God, Jesus, on the cross 2,000 years ago. And uh, no one could assist him in that effort to redeem man. And those who tried to assist him only frustrated his purpose. His purpose was to pay the debt that we could never pay. It's a gift. It cannot be earned. But the Pope says we can earn forgiveness of sins and redemption, salvation, by buying indulgences, which the proceeds, uh, according to Rome, was going to build a brand new church in the Vatican, St. Peter's Basilica. And uh, many people caught on right away to this imposture. And we were reading an anecdotal story of of a woman, the wife of a shoemaker, a cobbler, who against the will of his her husband saw one of these dealers in the pope's uh, indulgences and against his hus- her husband's wishes purchased one of these indulgences, wasted some good money. You know, the shoemaker must have been furious at his wife for being so gullible to start with and then for taking precious what precious little money they had to purchase her salvation. But nonetheless, she did, and she eventually died and left her husband in possession of this uh, license to sin, this free pass out of purgatory. And it was customary and even punishable by the civil law if you did not have masses said for your dead spouse. So this cobbler, with this indulgence in his hand that guarantees that his wife at the moment of death went straight to heaven and bypassed purgatory, was criticized for not having masses said for the repose of the soul of her wife, of his wife. And he was hauled into court to give an account of this. And the man simply told the judge, I don't have to have masses said for my wife because she purchased an indulgence which guarantees that the very time, the very instant of her death, she would go straight to heaven and bypass purgatory. So therefore, no masses are necessary. And the judge, after reading the indulgence, acquitted the man. Okay? So you can see the civil power was used to punish uh, Christians at the behest of the Pope, and also it gave credence to these indulgences, these licenses sold by the Pope for the forgiveness of sins. So we have a union of church and state. The church issues these lying wonders called indulgences, and the state acts in response to them. And so uh, 
This is just one of the outrages, one of the anecdotal stories given in this account of how these these indulgences were used and how they were even defended by the civil authorities. Now, another occasion, and we're, we're beginning in the first full paragraph uh, during uh, in the middle of the page 445. It says, another occasion... A gentleman of Saxony had heard Tetzel at Leipzig and was much shocked by his impostures. Here's a man who hears Tetzel selling these bogus wares, this this, uh, bogus commodity of indulgences, and he's going to make an example out of Tetzel. He went to the monk, Tetzel, and inquired if he was authorized to pardon sins in intention or such as the applicant intended to commit. In other words, he simply asked Tetzel, can you sell me an indulgence for a sin that I would like to commit in the future? Okay? And Tetzel answered, quote, assuredly, answered Tetzel, I have full power from the Pope to do so. Well, said the gentleman, I want to take some slight revenge on one of my enemies without attempting his life. I will pay you ten crowns if you will give me a letter of indulgence that shall bear me harmless. Unquote. And Tetzel made some scruples, which means he did some calculations, and they struck a bargain for thirty crowns. Okay, Tetzel raises the price from ten crowns to thirty crowns, but he's going to issue this indulgence guaranteeing this man to be harmless when he takes vengeance on his enemy okay his sin will not be held account to him. will be not held against him he'll be forgiven before he ever commits the sin so you see a whole other aspect of these indulgences now you can buy them For enough money, you can buy an indulgence for sins that you intend to commit in the future. This is just how outrageous these indulgences are. And this is why we call it a license to sin. This is why Martin Luther called them licenses to sin. Now, Tetzel made some scruples, and they struck a bargain for 30 crowns. Shortly after, the monks set out for Leipzig. Okay, Tetzel's made all the money he can from the sale of indulgences, and he's heading back to Leipzig. Now, the gentleman who purchased this indulgence for a sin that he intended to commit, he was attended with his, by his servants, and they laid wait for Tetzel in the woods between Jutterbach and Treblin. And they fell on him. Okay, they attacked Tetzel and gave him a beating, and carried off the rich chest of indulgence money the Inquisitor had with him. Okay? So they beat the crap out of Tetzel and took all his money. Now Tetzel clamored against this act of violence and brought an action before the judges. Okay? Sued the man. But the gentleman showed the letter signed by Tetzel himself which exempted him beforehand of all responsibility. Duke George, who had at first been much irritated at this action, upon seeing this writing, ordered that the accused man should be acquitted. So Tetzel sold for money the forgiveness of sin ahead of time, and the man attacked Tetzel, took all of his money, and was judged acquitted because Tetzel's own signature was found on the indulgence. Now, surely my listeners can understand how it was, through the mercy of God, that these stories became known and demonstrated the diabolical nature of the Pope and his indulgences. And this is what led to the Protestant Reformation. The overspreading <coughs> realization that the Pope does not have the power to, to forgive sins. In other words, he does not have the power of the keys, as the papacy has always claimed, the keys of binding and loosing. 
The Pope had just gone too far. And those who realized what an, an obnoxious and diabolical pretension these indulgences were, they soon had to realize also that they were literally purchasing their salvation by going on crusades, by going on pilgrimages, by paying for masses to be said for the repose of the souls of their dead relatives. The whole Roman Catholic Church doctrine was a lie. And the, Pope, the only conclusion one can come to at this point is that the Pope is the Antichrist. He is the counterfeit Christ. And that is the very foundation of Protestantism. Not only that Jesus is the Christ, but that the papacy is his counterfeit. Now you have the full manifestation of what truth is necessary to liberate all of quote-unquote Christendom from papal control, both spiritual control and temporal control. Remember, all the kings of the earth did the Pope's bidding. And when they did the Pope's bidding, they thought they were doing God's justice. But when the reality began to sink in, that the papacy is nothing but the man of sin, even the kings of the earth would no longer obey him. Okay? They didn't want to be subject to the wrath of Almighty God. And this was simply, the whole thing amounts to God's merciful revelation to mankind who the Antichrist is. Now, you simply have to ask yourself, if this is what Protestants believed 500 years ago, how is it that they believe so much differently today? No, if you asked a thousand so-called self-professed Protestants, what does it mean to be a Protestant, they can't tell you. When instantly from their mouth should come the words, the papacy is the Antichrist, we protest the papacy. The papacy has no legitimate power in the world. He is not the vicar of Jesus Christ. He is the vicar of Satan himself. This is the words that should automatically flow through the mouth of a Protestant when asked, who is the Antichrist? And yet, if you ask a thousand self-professing Protestants today who the Antichrist is, they can't tell you. Or at least will give you a thousand different answers which amounts to the same thing. They simply do not know. Now, how could 500 years be enough time to erase the very foundation of the Protestant Reformation? And who is responsible for this ignorance, this widespread, all-encompassing ignorance? First of all, it's the Jesuits for, for, for preaching in the Protestant seminaries that the Antichrist is future. That the Antichrist won't be revealed until the end of time. This is the ancient teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. It's what resulted in the, the suppression of all Roman Catholics throughout the history of the Roman Catholic Church who came to the only conclusion one can come to when he reads the scriptures. That the papacy is the Antichrist. So to stifle dissent within the Roman Catholic Church and stop Catholics from calling the Pope the Antichrist, the Roman Catholic Church just simply came up with an alternative teaching that the Antichrist is either pick one or the other. The Antichrist is either one of the ancient Roman Caesars, Caligula or Nero. And now that they are out of the way, thou, now the Holy Roman Empire under the, under the Vicar of Christ, the Kingdom of Christ, is with men in the headship of the Pope. Now, either that, or you can believe, and which is widely, almost universally believed in all of Christendom today, that the Antichrist is yet future, has never set foot in the world, is not a figment of history. He's yet to, to materialize. That, together, those two teachings, those two alternate teachings of Bible prophecy is what exonerated the papacy in the minds of Catholics for 2,000 years, and it has now deceived the Protestants. And it's so easily seen through that even a child can see it. All right, 500 years ago, everyone knew. Everyone who was honest with himself, honest with the scriptures, and honest with history had to, had to admit 
that the papacy is the Antichrist. All right? You just simply have to ask yourself, who is responsible? I told you the Jesuits for teaching futurism in the Protestant seminaries, and then all the Protestant pastors coming out of these these uh, Protestant seminaries are regurgitating Roman Catholic teaching. And now they occupy the spaces behind all the pulpits of the Protestant churches. There's not one that tells the truth. There's not one who tells the Protestant truth. And that's why this country is going to hell in a handbasket. This is why the popes of Rome can waltz into this country and kiss the ground at Edwards Air Force Base, trample all over the White House lawn, have praises sang, to Deum sang in his defense, happy birthday sung for him, and then he addresses the whole nation from the Capitol building. Do you realize that 500 years ago, the Pope would never have been allowed to land in this country? Much less trample all over the halls of, of, of law in this country? It would never have been possible 500 years ago. And yet no one thinks anything of it when the Pope comes to this country. They think it's a blessing. It's an omen from God that the Pope has come to this country to bless this country and to... to to lecture us, give us moral lectures from the halls of Congress. You can't get more deceived than we are today. Protestantism is dead for all practical purposes, simply because they do not know who the Antichrist is. Sure, they can preach Jesus till the cows come home, but then they turn around and let the other master come to this country and rule and reign like a god. And our own government responds to him as if he were the voice of God in this country and passes laws in this country binding all of its citizens, Catholic, Protestant, and otherwise, to laws that are fashioned after Roman Catholic canon law. This is what you get when you forget who the Antichrist is. And there's no one more responsible for our ignorance today than Protestant pastors. And I don't even call them pastors anymore. They don't pastor the sheep. They feed off of the sheep. I call them priesters. Okay, Roman Catholic priesters. The only thing different between the pastors behind the pulpits of the Protestant churches today and the bishops who stand behind the pulpits of the Roman Catholic churches, the only difference is the priesters, the Protestant priesters, don't wear the fish head hat. That's the only difference. You put a fish head hat on them, you can't tell the difference. They're preaching the same nonsense. That's your ecumenical movement. Vatican Council II would never have been possible had Protestants maintained the truth that they learned 500 years ago in the life and times of these that we've been speaking about. John Huss, Jerome of Prague, uh, 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 Martin Luther and all the saints before them, all the saints before them. I've proven over and over and over again, even the first century Christians knew who the Antichrist would be hundreds of years before he he materialized in the world. Why? Because Paul told them flat out, he who now restrains will restrain the rise of Antichrist until he is taken out of the way, and then that wicked shall be revealed. And we know that in history to be none other than the old pagan Roman Empire under the Caesars. Paul was predicting the imminent fall of the Roman Empire, and it happened just as exactly how Paul predicted it. The Caesars were taken out of the way, and what replaced him but the papal Caesar. The old Roman Empire was replaced by the Holy Roman Empire. And there's no other interpretation can be given to this. 
all agree Rome fell simply to morph into Papal Rome. Pagan Rome became Papal Rome. And even the popes have taken upon themselves the title Caesar. It's in their writings. One cannot be mistaken about who the Antichrist is, yet all Christendom today is mistaken. They don't have a clue. And what gets me more than anything else, what disturbs my spirit more than anything else, is the, the people who repeat this mantra, this mantra all the time. We don't know who he is. He might be this or he might be that. It's a simply stating that though God sent his only begotten son to bleed and die and to bear upon his body our sins and thereby redeem us to God and that we should know him and should be known by him that that same Jesus forgot to tell us who the Antichrist is, who would deceive the whole world, who would reign over the kings of the earth, be drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. That the same Jesus who came to bear upon his body our sins and redeem us to God was so thoughtless and forgetful and so treacherous with the souls for whom he died as to not tell us beforehand who the Antichrist is who would deceive the whole world and put our souls in jeopardy. You see, every time you say that you don't know who the Antichrist is or that he's from the distant past or he's from the future, you're simply saying God plays fast and loose with the souls for whom his son bled and died to redeem. You're calling God a treacherous Savior, you're defaming him every time you say you don't know who the Antichrist is or that he's future or that he's from the distant past. No, it's, it's God who's mer merciful. It's God who is merciful. And even the first century Christians, he didn't let one generation slip before he told his people who the Antichrist would be. And there have been always Christians, Bible-believing Christians, who read and understood what Paul said, who said, you know who the Antichrist is when he rises to power after the Caesars are taken out of the way. And we know from Daniel's prophecy it will be a Roman. Because the fourth and final kingdom upon the earth, according to Daniel's prophecy, is the Roman Empire, which was in power at the time Jesus walked the streets of Jerusalem. That's why Jesus said, don't you know that this is the last times? These are the last times? Rome was already in power. The fourth and final kingdom upon the earth was already in power. And all there was left was for that power to morph into the Roman papal system. It's still Roman. There won't be a fifth kingdom upon the earth. Okay, There's no empire for the Jews. There's no kingdom for the Jews. The Roman Empire will not be replaced by a Jewish empire, despite what all the idiots in the world will teach you. It's going to be Roman till Christ returns. First pagan, pagan Rome and now papal Rome. And no one's going to change that but Christ. And when he comes, all the kingdoms of this world will be of our Savior. They will all fall at his feet. They will be destroyed without hand. So stop believing in futurism. We'll be back right after this.
Hear it first on FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. If you'd like to get a copy of this program, you may subscribe at FirstAmendmentRadio.com for only $45 a month. And you'll receive an MP3 CD weekly of all of our programs. As a bonus, we'll send you a password for our audio archives online. That's a $15 value. Or you may request any month of any program on one MP3 CD for a minimum donation of only $25. Or any single program on MP3 CD or CD for only $15. You may do all of this online at FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Just follow the instructions to make a donation or subscribe. You may also adopt an hour of your favorite program. Please don't forget that most of the programs on FirstAmendmentRadio.com are listener-supported. Thank you from all of us here at FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased. It has been stolen. There's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity. Invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188. Welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. And if you'd like to support this program and keep it on the air, please support First Amendment Radio. Now, I want to continue <clears throat> where I left off before the break. Look, some, somebody might legitimately, or illegitimately, as the case may be, <laughs> accuse me of saying, Tom, you know, this was 500 years ago. Rome has changed. Uh, Rome isn't selling indulgences anymore. Stop right there. Benedict XVI publicly reinstated indulgences as though they had ever been suspended. And he also reinstated the Roman Catholic Jubilee. Okay? Publicly. It's not a secret. It was announced in the press. It was announced in papal encyclicals and dispatches from Rome itself. Indulgences never died, neither did jubilees. They were suspended for a while during the protest. But now that the protest is over, the Pope is free to publicly reinstate indulgences and jubilees and all the other abominations of the papacy. Why? Because no one left the protest. Okay? It's simply for a lack of Protestantism in this country that the Pope was publicly able to reinstate uh, uh, indulgences and jubilees. That the Pope would dare in this country to reinstate these abominations is simply an an attestation that Protestantism is dead. No one protests the Pope anymore. Nobody says the Pope is the Antichrist. Nobody says indulgences are wrong. Nobody even knows what an indulgence is. And that's why it is so important to read this history for God's people. The man of sin is still in the world, just like he's been in the world for nearly 2,000 years. He still calls himself the vicar of Christ, the replacement of the Son of God on earth. The voice of God, the oracle of God, the high priest of Christianity, and he's a liar. Lock, stock, and barrel. There's never a truth that comes out of his mouth. Why? Because his father is the father of lies. God is not his father. Lucifer is. Satan is his father. Martin Luther was absolutely right. The papacy is just the physical manifestation of Satan himself. Just as much as the body of Christ is 
correctly called the body of Christ in this world because it's the spitting image of Christ, or should be. Likewise, the papacy is the spitting image of Satan himself. And he's fulfilling the five-pointed prophecy, false though it may be, that Lucifer uttered in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 through 14. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. He's doing it through the papacy. And we have physical, visible evidence to prove it. By the admission of a Roman Catholic uh, uh, Knight of Malta, Francis Rooney, in his book, The Global Vatican, he admitted that the papacy controls the kings of the earth, even today. He even controls the United Nations. He controls domestic and foreign policy for this country. And he even described in his book the methods by which he does it. No one with any credibility can deny the truth. The admitted truth by a Knight of Malta, no less. U.S. Ambassador to the Holy See, Francis Rooney, under the George W. Bush administration. Now, what are the consequences of futurism? The belief that the Pope is yet future, or that the Antichrist is yet future? A single individual that comes just before Christ returns. The Pope's free to do what he wants. Rule and reign over the kings of the earth once more. Because the protest died. Well, I'm here to tell you, on First Amendment Radio, on the Inquisition Update, the protest is raging! And I implore my listeners to examine their conscience, to examine the scriptures, to examine history, and see for yourself, futurism is a lie. Told from all the pulpits of the Protestant churches today, it's the same method by which the papacy silenced dissent even within the Roman Catholic Church for a thousand years. It is now used the same way to silence dissent of the Protestants. If you believe that the papacy is Nero or Caligula of the old Roman Empire, you're a Catholic. And if you believe that the Antichrist is yet future, you're a Catholic. You've allowed the papacy to run rampant, roughshod over all the kings and the governments of the world and even your Protestant brothers and sisters. You're bringing the papal inquisition to this country and around the world by regurgitating these lies. You talk about a future seven-year period of time. When the seven-year period of time spoken of in Daniel's prophecy made reference specifically to the seven-year ministry of Jesus Christ on the earth. Oh, but Tom, he only, he only ministered for three and a half years. He ministered for three and a half years in the flesh until he gave up the ghost and said, It is finished. Our redemption is sure. And then through his spirit, through the, the apostles, and they continued to minister the Messiahship of Jesus to the Jews for the remaining three and a half years. And then the gospel went to the Gentiles. You want to talk about a seven-year period of time? All you have to do is read the New Testament. It's a historical record of those seven years. That's why it was written. To show us the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy. It was prophesying the coming of Messiah. There's no mention of the Antichrist in Daniel's prophecy. His prophecy focused specifically on Messiah's seven-year ministry. And you tell me there's a future seven-year period of time? You're lying. You're regurgitating lies you can't even substantiate. Not from history, not from Scripture, not from prophecy. You're just regurgitating the futurist lies. 
And most of you won't take correction. That's what's so hideous. Rome sits on her diabolical throne in Rome and just laughs his diabolical butt off because we believe all of his lies. Why are we so gullible? He's got us all believing. The Antichrist is yet future. We don't even have to worry about him because in the middle of that seven-year period of time, ka We're going straight up. We're never going to see the Antichrist. We're never going to suffer persecution when the Bible plainly says all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And you know who suffers persecution? Those who say the papacy is the Antichrist. You know who suffered persecution in the past throughout all Christian history? Those who said the papacy is the Antichrist. Now, of course... If you do not say that the papacy is Antichrist, you don't suffer much persecution. That means God must be blessing you, right? That's what you're taught to believe in the pulpits. You don't suffer any persecution. You got two cars in the driveway. You got a full heated garage attached to your house. You got a retirement 501 or 401k or whatever they call them. I don't know because I don't have one. Life's a bowl of cherries for all you futurists. Blab it and grab it. You pay money to the pastor and you expect God to just ka-ching, dump more wealth and blessings on you. You know what you're doing? You're buying indulgences, aren't you? You give your money to the pastor and ka-ching, you expect a blessing from God. And all of a sudden another Mercedes shows up in your driveway. You're Catholic. You believe in indulgences, don't you? God's blessings for money. God's wealth and blessings for money. And you can just go right on sinning. That's what indulgences do. They promote sin. So you take your wealth and you sin with it. Now, I'm not going to enumerate all your sins, because you know better than I do what your sins are, but... You're under God's blessing, right? Blab it and grab it. Just pay the pastor and pray, and, and, and pray, 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 and all of a sudden a new blessing shows up in your driveway. It's Roman Catholicism. God's people suffer persecution. Why? Because they protest the man of sin in Rome. We look for our blessing in the afterlife when we know through the mouth of Jesus that we will be joint heirs with him. And until then, we're persecuted all the day long, led like sheep to the slaughter. Now, some of us take that persecution more gracefully than others, and I've never called myself graceful. But we take it nonetheless. But we never silence our protest against the Pope, no matter what the cost. That's what it is to be a Protestant. We don't pray for material blessings. And we don't pay priesters to get them. Okay, well, this nonsense of uh, indulgences goes even further. Here's another anecdotal story in this wonderful Protestant history book. A miner from Schneesburg, meeting a seller of indulgences, inquired, question, quote, Must we then believe what you have often said of the power of indulgences and of the authority of the Pope? and think that we can redeem a soul from purgatory by casting a penny into your chest, unquote. The dealer in indulgences affirmed that it was so. Quote, Ah, replied the miner, what a cruel man the Pope must be, thus to leave a poor soul to suffer so long in the flames of purgatory for a wretched penny. If he has no ready money, in other words, if he doesn't have any money in his pocket, 
let him collect a few hundred thousand crowns of gold and deliver all these souls by one act. Even we poor folks who can't afford any gold florins would willingly pay the Pope the principal and the interest, unquote. You see what a revelation this is? This man from Schneesburg says if the Pope can sell indulgences, in other words, if he can buy us out of purgatory with our own money, why doesn't he take just a little bit of his and spring us all from purgatory? Isn't that what Jesus came to do? To spring us all from heaven or from hell into heaven? Why doesn't the Pope do likewise? If it's money that God honors, the Pope's got plenty. And if he doesn't have enough, we'll, we'll take out a loan and we'll pay the principal and the interest and the Pope can spring us all out of purgatory. But the Pope won't do it, will he? He's wicked. The man of wickedness. The man of sin, the son of perdition. The Bible called him right. Even, an, even a poor man in Europe, was smart enough to say that if the Pope can buy our way out of hell, all he's got to do is take out enough loan to purchase us all from this writhing flames of purgatory, and we'll pay back on installments the principal and the interest. Let the Pope take out a loan if he doesn't have enough money and buy us all out of perdition, and we'll pay it back penny by penny. But spring us now. Don't let another saint suffer in the flames of purgatory just because the Pope doesn't have enough money. You see the logic in all this? I, I, want, I just, it's amazing to me the mercy of God in revealing these things 500 years ago. And we've forgotten them today. No one can even hardly tell you what an indulgence was. Nor how they were used. Purgatory doesn't even exist. There's not a word in the Bible that, says, that speaks of purgatory or anything like it. There's either heaven or hell. Or hell. And we are given the gift of salvation by believing in the shed blood of Jesus as a propitiatory sacrifice for our sins. And we can't buy it. There's not enough money in all heaven and earth to purchase it. And if we had all the money in heaven and earth, we couldn't buy it. <coughs> But Pope Benedict XVI says, you can still buy it. I still sell indulgences. There's no one to protest it anymore. I can do anything I want. And I can herald the new Jubilee, too. Rolling in the dough. Raking in the dough. Ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. Look. Wicked man just cannot comprehend, cannot conceive, and cannot redeem, re receive the free gift of salvation. Nor can he understand the incalculable cost that our Christ paid for our redemption. So it's much easier to believe that the Pope can sell you something that will get you there. I'd rather believe in a flesh and blood man than the all glorious Christ. If you want to pay for your salvation, stay in this ecumenical movement because you'll be paying. Whoa, you'll be paying. And the Pope will get richer and more powerful by the day. The man of sin, the son of perdition will rule and reign over the kings of the earth just like he did a thousand years ago. And you'll get your new world order, but there won't be nothing new about it. It'll be the smit, spitting image of all of Christendom a thousand years ago when the popes were in the noonday of their reign 
and the people were in the midnight of the world. Slaves and serfs, spiritual and temporal bondmen of the Pope. The man of sin, the son of perdition. What do you think of your Protestant pastor now? Does he still deserve your praise and your prayers? Well, I say don't stop praying for him. Just refashion the form of your prayers to ask the Lord to mercifully give him the truth so that he can teach the Protestant truth. And if he refuses, ask God to take him out. That's the only hope we have. They either return to the truth of the gospel and renounce this man of sin and their ecumenical movement, or God needs to take them out. And that's what our prayer should be. All right, a miner from Sneesburg, meeting a seller of indulgences, inquired, Must we then believe what you've often said of the power of indulgences and the authority of the Pope, and think that we can redeem a soul from purgatory by casting a penny into your chest? The dealer in indulgences affirmed that it was so. Ah, replied the, manor, the, ma the miner, what a cruel man the Pope must be, thus to leave poor souls in purgatory to suffer so long in the flames for a wretched penny. If the Pope doesn't have any ready cash in his pocket, let him collect a few hundred thousand crowns and deliver all these souls by one act. Even we poor folks would be willingly pay the interest and the, the principal. Unquote. But the Pope, even though he has all the gold and all the silver, cannot buy you salvation or forgive your sins. If you do not believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Redeemer, and that salvation is a free gift, and no merit is involved, then you will die in your sins. Jesus said, if you do not believe that I am He, the Messiah, you will die in your sins. And what did Jesus come to do? To bear our sins upon His body and to take our punishment. Now, one perfect way to deny that Jesus is your Messiah and that He came to die for you and to take upon His body your sins and redeem you to, uh, from your sins and reconcile you to God, the best way to demonstrate that disbelief is to pretend to purchase that salvation for money and give your money to a man, a sin-sick man, as a matter of fact, the most sinful human institution that ever drew a breath in the history of this creation. Now, what do you think of the ecumenical movement? It's spiritual harlotry. That's what it is. It's an in-your-face rejection of Jesus Christ in favor of Antichrist, the papacy. It's treason. It's treason against heaven. That's what the ecumenical movement is. It's a denial that Jesus has come in the flesh. That's the spirit of Antichrist. So saith the Scriptures. It's a hideous reality. It's not a figment of anyone's imagination. It's visible truth. The whole quote-unquote Christian world is in rebellion against Christ. Just like the religious leaders of the day when Jesus walked the streets of Jerusalem, when he came the first time, what did he find? All of Israel rebelling against him and his father. Even so much so that they crucified him. 
and there's no, we are no less like them today. We believe in lies, carefully devised fables. We were not diligent to search the Scriptures, to search the prophecies and their historical fulfillment. Had we been diligent to keep the faith, no one would ever, even today, be deceived about the papacy or its monstrous pretension. To the degree that the world is ecumenical is the degree to which Christ's judgment is about to fall. I intend to maintain the protest until God takes me out. All I can do is hope and pray my listeners will bring more listenership to this program, share the truth with friends and family, and pray for me and for First Amendment Radio and everyone else who take upon himself the responsibility to tell the truth, no matter the cost. Subsection 78. At this time, Martin Luther was performing his quiet duties as an Augustinian monk. He was full of respect to the Pope. Remember, he was Roman Catholic. He was one of the Pope's monks. He had all kinds of respect for the Pope. He even called him Most Holy Father. He was full of respect to the Pope. And as he himself says, quote, so steeped in the Romish doctrines that I would willingly have helped kill anyone who had the authority to refuse the smallest act of obedience to the Pope. Okay? I would help to kill anyone who had the audacity to refuse the smallest act of obedience to the Pope. He says, I was a true Saul, like many others still living. Martin Luther likened himself to Saul of Tarsus. Before he became Paul, he was a persecutor of the saints. Out of his own mouth, Martin Luther admits. But God had a revelation for him. And just like Paul, he made Martin Luther the, the, the icon of the Protestant Reformation. I'll see you tomorrow. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, internet, or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org.
When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn, the Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a re-established Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's crossthebordered.org.